Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Saturday morning's version of Turnips Digest. Uh, I will be covering today the lost cause with our favorite historian, uh, Christopher Sandbatch. How are you? My favorite historian? I don't know how we got there. Well, you uh, also hold the title of being the only historian that I've had. Right. Right. That's, but, you know, there are things that happen because this is, and this is, I don't know if you all saw the, if anybody would be familiar with the stream I did with Prudentialists about the Monroe Doctrine a couple of weeks ago. And I think I, I did another podcast. I don't know if it's come out yet about, uh, Andrew Jackson, and nobody's going to like that one, but it, I think it's actually probably one of my better appearances. And uh, I, I tell people all the time, though, that I was like, I keep getting better as a in relative as a like relative to other historians because not because I am getting better, but because all the ones that are better than me are dying. <laughs> so, so if I all I got to do is hold course steady, and I'll be on top of the pile in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I uh, I can assume that uh, the field of uh, history is like all other fields, and that all the new entries are getting worse. Yeah, it's been since really since about the 1980s. That 1980 or so is kind of this. We're actually going to get to talk about that a little bit, but 1980 is kind of this weird line in the sand where every pretty much everything, all academic fields, start to get. They've been, you know, it's easy to go back and say, it's like, well, they've been getting worse since the Reformation, you know, but the, <laughs> the but there isn't like there are marked inflection points whenever the deterioration intensifies and 1980 is one of them. So basically anybody that got their got their graduate degree prior to 19, I mean, prior to 1980 is going to be they're almost godlike in their ability to 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 you know, to synthesize narratives compared to anything that came after it. And it always sort of, you know, always sort of amazes me whenever I get to actually interact with them. Actually, you know, just before before we do anything else, like something along those lines, I don't know if because you're too young almost even remember this, like they may not even have this stuff in libraries anymore. But, you know, like for whenever I say, for instance, I want to talk about the lost cause. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten tabs pulled up right now with different academic articles that I have used at various times um, to, you know, sort of to, to, to talk about this stuff. But prior to the, you know, prior to the 1980s or so, you would not have been able to do that. You'd have had to actually have physical access to the you know, the, the hard copy of the journal that the article was written in. And this is like this selected for a much, I guess, a, a very different type of person than what enters the academy today. You know, there's not many people that have the that have, I guess, the, the even the, the the object permanence to go hunt through art. So tend to be the historians from the past tend to be a little bit better than a little bit better than we are now. For reasons that aren't generally explored, like nobody ever says, everybody knows about creepy leftism and that sort of thing. But <coughs> people tend not to think about, oh, access to documents. You know, it's all the right. eternal, eternal September in, act in academia is what's going on. But yeah, all right. <laughs> so, that was a lot at once. Yeah, no, that's fine. And it's going to be good because that's kind of uh, setting the uh, setting a uh, foreshadowing of the topic. And I, I can also imagine a lack of uh, control F could do something to uh, a lot of narrative crafting that we would get in the modern day if it was to just suddenly disappear. I was um, 27 before I learned what the control F feature did. Yeah, That's so, like an in in interesting, like that changed, that changed my life. Also being able to split windows, like hit the windows button and the arrow button. And you, so you could, you can type on one side of the screen and, uh, and read on the other. That was a game changer. Didn't learn that till like last year. <laughs> right. So, um, anyways, uh, to continue the, uh, the introduction, um, you will find in the description, a link to, uh, Mr. Sandbatch's, uh, sub stack, uh, Americana Esoterica, I believe is how it turns as how it, uh, appears. Um, but his telegram is Esoterica Americana. So uh, go check him out um, if you get the chance. And uh, before we start, one last thing. I am very grateful to all the people that are monetarily supporting me. Um, if you like what I do and think that it's of high enough quality, uh, check the link in the description. I am rather grateful. Uh, so with the introductions done... Um, I, this last week, uh, due to various different reasons, have come, come across probably the uh, 
greatest historical boogeyman uh, that I've certainly ever heard of, um, at least in the United States context, and that is the lost cause. Um, every single time I hear the words lost cause, it's usually a mainstream uh, history teacher or academic or a leftist um, basically just throwing it out there as the irrefutable evidence that this is what went wrong during Reconstruction after the Civil War. It's where the United States took a dark turn, and it's where racism and white supremacy has reigned ever since. Uh, so that's where I've uh, seen the vast majority of it. We didn't even get uh, taught about it at all in uh, history class when I was in United States history. And I don't know if that's just because um, the historiography is wrong or if it's because it was a very partisan uh, historiography to begin with. So, uh, Mr. Sambach, uh, that's what we're leading into with. Uh, perhaps you can take it from there. Well, the first thing to get right, there's like, and this is a pretty common theme with me is that we're going to you ask me what something is and I'll tell you, well, there's the, there's the narrow sense and then there's the larger sense. Uh, and this is the, the lost cause is in many ways, you're right to notice that it's usually a mainstream. It's usually an, going to be an academic historian. Okay. So the first thing we need to know about the lost cause is that this is a, a topic that has special significance specifically for professional historians. Okay. And this is because in large measure, the actual formal growth of uh, history as a field of study in the United States is, has, has, in many ways grown out of this argument over the civil war. Now you were ab absolutely correct to note. I, in fact, I, I think other than Jesus Christ, there have been more books written about, I, in, including Abraham Lincoln, including the specific topic of Abraham Lincoln. There have been more books written about the C American civil war than any other, any topic except Jesus in the, in the history of the world. So, uh, since the end of the Civil War, one book has been published about either the Civil War or Abraham Lincoln every five minutes. Okay, and so <laughs> there's and and one of the things that's amazing is that um, 150 years after now, one here's one of the things that uh, that the, the the lost cause is important for because historians will kind of tell you one thing in like, okay, I'm looking at one of the websites I have pulled up here is battlefields.org. And cause so this is kind of what we would refer to as a public facing uh, in, in, if you go to grad school for history, they'll call this public history. This is the field of public history. So this is going to be in the field of, you, you, your job is to interface with the public. If you go to the Gettysburg battlefield and you talk to the tour guides and you go to the museums and that sort of thing, that all that's all stuff that goes into the field of public history. So the, there is a public history of what the lost cause represents. And then there's a kind of private in in academic journals, which are should probably be really understood as trade publications. Uh, you were like interdepartmental memos that have a very different idea of what the lost cause is and, and, and what it represents. But just to get to this real quickly and, you know, put a pen on it real quickly, what the lost cause actually is is a mode of talking about history, specifically the history of the American Civil War, that um, doesn't really have that much to do with the Civil War itself, oddly enough. It, 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 it grew out of the years 1866 to 1868 more than it did anything else. Uh, and what it, what it essentially is, and this is in the very strict sense of like well, what the, what the lost cause is um is a body of works that aren't even really academic in nature because this is there's no there actually is no real academic study of history in the 1860s uh it's a set of articles that were written by the confederate general jubal early and a, and a set of really pamphlets um, that were published by a number of journalists and, you know, social critics across the South at the end of the war. Um, 
Edward A. Pollard is the most important one. And he's the one who gives the, uh, he's the one who gives the, the, the moniker, the lost cause. And he, he, he published really, he, he, he coins two phrases in a way. He coins the phrase Edward A. Pollard and he coins the phrase, the a, a new South. And these are two words that are going to be almost inexorably intertwined with one another for the next century. He publishes a book called the lost cause A new Southern history of the war of the Confederates. And, this is a book that in really a unique sense, the, the, I, we recognize it, normies, I think, will recognize it. And maybe, you know, even dissident right wingers just sort of because you all are used to dealing with history as a political uh, cudgel more than more than maybe I am. Because, you know, I, I, I tend to think that there is history and there, you know, tends there needs to be an effort to make it conform to reality. But the Lost Cause actually comes out of a, a, a tradition of writing history in which. Um, the point of the history, like the, the, the story in the history itself does not necessarily make any attempt to, you know, conform itself to the reality of the situation. So what the lost cause tends to be, uh, is it's going to be, like I said, it's a collection of like mid-level Confederates. Uh, Jubal Early is a great example. Jubal Early was a not terribly successful Confederate general, not a terribly unsuccessful one either. And he had the good fortune to not die or, or suffer any kind of like real catastrophic defeat that would, you know, in call his honor into question. And uh, in the aftermath of the civil war, these, these ex Confederates, these, uh, and, some of their appendages in the, you know, like they were Confederate bureaucrats or they were the children of Confederate bureaucrats. Um, they represent in the main, the old planter class, you know, the old class of planters who had in many ways borne the brunt of the fighting in the war. They have lost the war. Okay. And, you know, the war's over now. So there's no, you know, there's, there's no, there's no prop. There's no propagandizing to do on the basis of a continuing Confederate state. What they have to do now is they have to figure out how they can uh, how they can change in some way the re, the un, you know, popular understanding of why the war was fought in the first place. Okay, and so what you'll tend to see is uh, especially in lost cause writing. They're going, it starts almost as a literary movement, but it, it, it really starts to take, take fire as the, uh, it really starts to catch fire as the federal occupation of the South intensifies following, uh, following the war, in the, especially the years after the uh, amend, 13th through 15th Amendments were added. OK, and so this becomes this narrative where um, slavery doesn't really have figure. And this is one of the this is the thing that's going to that really makes the left angry is that slavery doesn't figure much into the lost cause. So in fact, in, or, it, 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 Edward Pollard himself. OK, this is what Edward Pollard says. This is the only time he really touches yeah. slavery in the in, in his book the lost cause he says we shall not enter upon the oh, you should do my voice we shall not enter upon the discussion of moral question of slavery now i'm not gonna do that well but we may suggest here whether that odious term slavery which has been so long imposed now listen to this language this is an, a, a charge that slavery wasn't really a thing that's a word that was imposed on us by the exaggeration of Northern writers upon the judgment and sympathies of the world is properly applied. And here we go. Okay. That word has been imposed, but it's, it's properly applied to that system of servitude in the South, which was really the mildest in the world, which did not rest on at rest on acts of debasement or disenfranchisement, but elevated the African and was in the interest of human improvement and which by the law of the land protected the Negro in life and limb and in many personal rights. And by the practice of the system bestowed upon him a sum of individual indulgences, which made him altogether the most striking type in the world of cheerfulness and contentment. And that's all he says. Okay. Like th this is justifiably controversial, 
But one of the things it does is it severely downplays the role of slavery in the machinations that led to the start of the Civil War. Okay, and so what they're going to need to rest their argument on that what they have done is not, you know, willful destruction of the Union, that what they've actually done is um, they attempted to exit a contract that they didn't agree with, that this most thing was mostly about states rights. This thing was mostly about it it was that there's a combination of maybe cavalier honor, maybe states' rights, and definitely states' rights, and maybe some sense of Christian theology. And these are the reasons why this war was necessary to fight. Okay, so that's the, that's the strict, that's that's a lot of talking again, but that's the strictest, narrowest concept of the lost cause that I can imagine. And just to, just to uh, summarize, and let me know if I've uh, missed this anywhere here. Um, What we're dealing with here is primarily a narrative rather than just strict history as you and I would understand it. And this narrative will then fit facts to it rather than trying to adapt as facts would would change that narrative. Uh, It it will mold uh, primary sources into its narrative rather than uh, try to uh, change itself. And uh, this was promoted primarily by mid-level Confederates that hadn't suffered any major losses, though they hadn't Uh, necessarily won any major victories either and also something else that it would do is uh try to uh give a different uh give a different reason for why the war happened uh is that a uh all right enough summary yeah 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 but again on the on the procedural stuff though i'll go back when i say lost cause documents are really best considered to be primary documents themselves okay because they are often written by people who it could be like instead of according, you know, it's literally the, uh, you know, trust me, bro, uh, school of writing history, you know, sources, trust me, bro, I was there. Um, and you'll see a lot like so that that's one of the one of the most like, well, this is what gave Jubal the only thing that really gives Jubal early himself any kind of stature to talk about the events of 1861 to 1865 is that he was there. Okay, and he's not going to, and he kind of, and this is another situation that this mirrors closely is the end of both World War One and World War Two. Whenever the generals on every side of both, especially World War One, the generals on every side of World War One tended to all produce personal memoirs, and they would, they would, they would catfight with one another. Also, so there's there's a second outgrowth here, which is that um, as these like kind of backroom as these, these, these catty uh, articles that these Confederate figures are publishing contra one another start to uh, start to proliferate, the, the relationships between these men starts to break down. And after 1870, they really start to lose any consistency in how they think about the war. So the generals from the East are going to want to blame the generals in the West. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Everybody can nobody can stand Pendleton. There's arguments about whether or not the guys that lost at Vicksburg were more responsible for a lot of the a lot of the arguments that we're familiar with about, you know, from Civil War buffs. So like, oh, what would have happened on this is a big one in Lost Cause historiography, because one of the people that the there's really two things that happen. This group of Confederates have um, one guy that they choose to lionize as the perfect distillation of all things that were good about the antebellum south who you think the person they've chosen is uh would this be robert e lee why did they choose robert e lee well um just from my cursory knowledge um he would have been sort of like the aristocratic class of the uh of the south the upper class if you will right um supposedly in his personal life he exemplar or he uh emulated a lot of the uh, old chival- chivalry uh, chivalric codes and attitudes. Um, he was also rather, uh, this might be wrong, but I seem to remember he was a little bit moderate on the issue of slavery. Uh, yeah, he wasn't he necessarily was. a firebrand, uh, but he also wasn't an abolitionist. Um, and he was also probably the most brilliant general of the South, up for debate, of course, because you had a few others. 
uh, but definitely the most recognizable. And also no, that one's iffy. That that one's iffy. No, no, that that's some lost causeism. That Robert Robert E. Lee is 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 definitely the greatest general of the of the of the Confederate Army. That's yeah. Like I said, lost here, but I've heard that before. Uh, yeah, other other ones being people like Thomas Jackson. Uh, but you're mostly right. You're mostly right, but you missed the most important thing that Robert E. Lee was for this argument, and that was dead. Okay. Ah, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> oh, okay, that, that lines up the timeline to me. So he's dead, right. and now they will start lionizing him in their uh, Right, their right. Heads. So we need this guy. We need, because again, this is a lost cause, or, lost causeism originally. We almost can't even call it a school of historiography. If you're familiar with Carl Schmidt and, you know, his ilk, the lost causeism is a political theology is what it is, you know, and it's it's a narrative that has good guys and bad guys. And again, the, the Yankees in lost causeism, the Yankees tend to be um, kind of one dimensional stick figures on the edge of this. Like so like it, whenever these characters talk about the Yankees. It's the, those people over there. We received intel. You know, they, they move in large blocks of formless men. Their generals are kind of one-dimensional characters who do. You know, they're not really evil, but they're also not really good, and they don't have a lot of agency. So they're like kind of like the ideal, you know, stuffed shirts. But there are heroes and villains in the South, and one of the, and in order to like sort of uh, weld this group of people together who are writing this this body of work that is referred to as lost cause, you know, history, they need someone that they can unify under, and there are some there's not many people to pick from. Okay, so you have on one hand you have Robert E. Lee, okay, commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, you have somebody like um, you have somebody like uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, the the undefeated general, you know, the, the the man who probably was on the field, the best Confederate general of the war. Right. Um, who is incidentally active in this scene, in this lost cause scene, producing producing content. He had a YouTube channel and he <laughs> um, uh, he. Yeah. You ends up, yeah, he ends up not being, for a number of reasons, a, a person that people can unify behind because he was in the West most of the time. And most of this stuff is most of this. The, the, the focus is on wanting to lionize the Army of Northern Virginia for a lot of reasons, because it was the largest one. So he's he's out. Um, you have uh, General James Longstreet, which you can look at. OK, he's Lee's quote, right hand man during the war. Um, but at Gettysburg, we've got this problem where um, General Longstreet didn't want to fight this battle. And so he went at it in a kind of half ass way. And it's actually the reason the South lost the Battle of Gettysburg was because of General James Longstreet's lack of commitment on July 3rd. There is also the problem that James Longstreet is not from Virginia. These lost cause figures tend to be from Virginia. Uh, the most coherent group of them, Ed Pollard himself is from Virginia. Um, they are really kind of nepotistic in the way they spread credit around to the Confederate, to you know, to Confederate figures, and they're going to they consistently give preferential treatment to Virginians and. Um, Longstreet had the misfortune of being from Georgia, but he also uh, joined the Republican Party after the war. And so now that, that moves him from being not a good candidate for the care, the person that we're going to unify around. Uh, he's now the villain. OK, yeah, so the, the 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 ultimate villain of Lost Cause, like uh, historiography or, or writing is um, is James Longstreet. And as reconstruction progresses james longstreet is going to be involved in an incident called the battle of liberty place which you know, not to get too doxy but actually work on the battlefield of the battle of liberty place um which is a, an incident that happened in new orleans in eight, 1874 i want to say 18, 1873 or 1874 when a number of ex-confederate 
uh, a number of, and this is a, this is a mob. Okay. So like think like 2020 tier, like, you know, like except left instead of left wing mobs, it's right wing mobs of white men who have gathered on the, who've gathered near what's called the Batura. I, I always get that word wrong. I, I've lived here for 20 years. I get that word wrong, but it's the, it's the name of the, the, the land that, that, uh, Sometimes it's flooded by the Mississippi River, but sometimes it's not. And they they gather there to protest, um, to really to to protest the existence of the uh, of the of the Reconstruction government. But because James Longtree has joined the uh, Republican Party, he's actually still in. He's he's in the U.S. Army now, and he. Uh Right. And before and he, we uh, go too far into this, uh, just for, I'm not going to assume my audience just knows everything about Reconstruction. Uh, besides the obvious, you know, the very obvious surface, surface level, why would the South not like the Republicans? Uh, why would they especially not like them during Reconstruction? Just sort of like a brief overview, if you will. Uh, oh, well, let me do the Battle of Liberty Place first, then we'll do, then we'll go back to that. Uh, Battle of Liberty Place <laughs> is a, um, <clears throat> it's an incident where, this group of ex-Confederate veterans uh, gather in New Orleans to protest uh, to, to to protest the, the 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 occupation government. And the occupation government sends federal soldiers, black mostly black Confederate soldiers, under the command of General James Longstreet to stand down this mob. And it culminates with uh, James Longstreet ultimately ordering black troops to fire on people who were, in many cases, Confederate veterans that had served under him. And that was the end of it. Okay. <laughs> but, but um, again, back to, to, back to reconstruction though, reconstruction is the, 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 the palette. It's the backdrop against which the lost cause develops. And this is why I say it's a, it's a political theology more than it is um, more than it is a, a narrative of the civil war or, or more than it is a history of the civil war, or even a history of what comes after it, because it is, consciously designed to be a resistance narrative this is like this is uh, and stick a pin in this we'll talk about this again we're talking about why the left hates this stuff so much because the left right. loves I, the I left just loves to, resistance right. narratives All right i just wanted to give a brief background for why longstreet being a member of the republicans and reconstruction south would be so terrible like yeah just right. brief, what what were they doing well during after the civil war um the south was militarily occupied by around the federal the well it wasn't initially initially the number of federal troops in the south dropped but some 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 things developed for andrew johnson was impeached and a andrew johnson was kind of was kind of a pro southerner that was in charge of the country he was the president of the united states and he was he wasn't a pro southerner because he did you know, he stayed in the u.s government during the uh during the civil war but he was kind of pro he was Pro being really light on the on right. on the South, so but then a couple a couple of things happened in 1866 and 1867. First of all, uh, the cotton crop fails two years in a row, and the you know the level the the rent gets too damn high across most of the South, and the federal government's response, especially the radical Reconstruction, the radical uh, the you know the radical Republican government, their response is to send more troops in to reactivate large swathes of the former Grand Army of the Republic and militarily occupy the South, um, and they did it brutally, and they they did it everywhere. So uh, you have this situation where lots of poor veterans of this war. Um, now find themselves in the position where, and, and, and this is another sort of development, is because the army, the, the soldiers in the Grand Army of the Republic that were available for remobilization were one only ones that had signed five-year enlistments. And so most of the actual, like, blue-eyed, you know, blonde-haired, you know, like, like six-foot-five, like, Yankee Ubermensch that had, you know, uh, that had fought at the battles of Gettysburg and Chancellorsville, you know, the real the real like uh core Yankee population. Well, they, their enlistments have already expired. So what they mostly have to work with are black troops that signed up in mass, black troops and foreign immigrants that signed up in mass in the later years of the war. These are the people whose enlistments, whose enlistment contracts said they could be reactivated. And so not only does the 
reconstruct does the radical reconstruction government reactivate large uh, uh, essentially puts the country back on wartime footing to militarily occupy a third of the continent they do so mostly with german speaking immigrant and black soldiers and for all kinds of totally conceivable reasons this rubbed the southern population the wrong way and immediately started creating a you know vigilante uh, uh, or you know yeah of 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 vigilante um, paramilitary force located largely in the back country. So after 1868, one of the things that characterizes the southern states is that and Louisiana and Louisiana and South Carolina are the two most intense locuses of of this violence, but it's pretty widespread across the entire South. Okay. Uh, that was one of the things I thought about doing was making a map of violent reconstruction events and overlaying it on a map of the Civil War. And what you'll end up finding is that the Civil War was relatively contained until the last year. It was relatively contained in a couple of very small areas. But the the, recon the reconstruction events, um, the you know acts of resistance against this federal occupation blanket the entire South. They mobilize in fact, a much larger portion of the total Southern population than the Confederate government ever did. And um, what you see is largely gun-toting Black men and um, foreign-speaking immigrants who have been right. given, you know, they've been given poli the political, you know, carte blanche to exploit the Southern, po the Southern population. And the lost cause develops as the kind of when we're talking about this narrative that's used to weld a lot of things together. This is the, you know, this is the uh, the narrative that these people unify around and fight, and it's their their nationalist narrative, their the you know their story for their reason for existence during what was ultimately the Second Civil War. Uh, and this is why I always say that the, re the lost cause has really a lot more to do with Reconstruction than it does with you know, the, the civil war itself. Cause these are, we're not talking about people who are especially concerned with remembering the battle of Gettysburg as it, you know, as it happened, they want to know a reason why what they did was right and why they need to continue this struggle against these, you know, against these, these, these occupying the blue bellies, the federals, the, um, the Freedmen's Bureau is an especially nasty the Freedmen's Bureau was a bit like the, uh, 19th century version of uh, like the ATF or something like that. So it's right. like, you know, like nobody liked it. So yeah, just to, and I'm sure you could elaborate much more, but the Freedmen's Bureau uh, had a job of ensuring the welfare of freedmen, as you might be able to guess by the name. And you can uh, probably assume as to what that entailed based off the picture that we are painting as to what the uh, federal government did during occupation. But they also parceled out land, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 40 from, acres and a mule. Right from a uh, conquered uh, plantations, uh, mostly right. Yeah, that's that. That's where the phrase "forty acres and a mule" actually comes from. These are land confiscations that were that were done by uh, Congress. Actually, Congress passes these laws that say that um, you know, never mind the fact that these people aren't technically war criminals. We're going to we're going to um, confiscate their land and give it to freedmen. Um, that's probably the this is the that's the group of people the the, the former planters they they're going to form a block called the Bourbon Democrats. Um, they're the most active in um, in in Lost Cause writing and in Lost Cause uh, myth. These are generally going to be people who were um, they were members of the planter class prior to the war. And what's sort of interesting is that they've, after the war, they act much more like aristocrats like, than they ever did before the war. And this is one of the things that's kind of, that's kind of interesting how the lost cause trickles down to us because a lot of people's, it is true, the left is correct whenever they, whenever they say that a lot of people's concept of the Civil War and the causes of the Civil War do have a lot of this, a lot of echoes of this lost causes in, in, in them. Um, but one of the things that changes is that this group of people who had 
before the war, they'd like kind of like to talk about themselves like aristocrats. But after the war, they really start acting like aristocrats, you know, like dressing, dressing the part. And but they'll be like in shabby clothes and this sort of thing. So you, you've got this, this kind of fallen gentility aspect. The whole thing is in, is, in, is designed to instill an aesthetic of tragedy and um, and a spirit of revanchism in 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 the people of the South. Um, right. And uh, just just as like an aside to like uh, show you kind of what my uh, historical education on this was like, I remember in my history textbook in my AP US history class about uh, three and a half years ago now, I suppose it would be, uh, when we got to the Bourbon Democrats, of course, I'd heard of them beforehand and read about them. Uh, but my, uh, my school textbook uh, made a, a very hilarious move. And they were playing up the fact that a lot of Bourbon Democrats uh, were from this sort of old, high-class, antebellum Southern caste. Um, and then they also tacked on the word classical liberal to them. Uh, I, I don't know. No, uh, that's interesting. That, oh, yeah. man. Oh, man. You just made me see colors because that is... The... <laughs> I just figured you would enjoy <laughs> to know that. I remember that vividly because I remember looking at that kind of like holding up the textbook and I was like, now why on earth would they do that? You know, what, what right. did they mean by this? They, 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 yeah. Enlightenment values or something like that. Um, the, but now one of the things about the lost cause that makes it so threatening is that it was very successful. Okay. You know, and just to give, and to, just to go into the primary sources, you know, uh, a former, U.S. a former um, federal general who actually was a Virginian. His name was George Henry Thomas. Uh, he was a Virginian that remained in the Union, dur remained with the Union Army during the war. And what he says, and this is in 1868, he says, the greatest efforts made by the defeated insurgents since the close of the war have been to promulgate the idea that the cause of liberty, justice, humanity, equality, and all the calendars of the virtues of freedom suffered violence and wrong when the effort for Southern independence failed. Now, Again, it, it, if it sounds like I'm like, like I, I'm taking an anti, because I'm sure I will be accused at some point today of taking an anti-Southern position on the lost cause here. I am generally favorable to the idea that the South was in the right in the War of 1860, 1861 to 1865. I'm convinced enough that I refuse to call it a civil war. You know, I'll, I'll call it the War of 1861, uh, get, given a chance, because I think that's what it was. It was, a, you know, it, was a, it was essentially a revolution. But it's not, I don't think any of these reasons, I don't think really many of these reasons that are given here and many of the reasons that the Lost Causers tended to highlight are an accurate depiction of either how the war started or even how it went. So I, I, I do, I do tend to fall down, come down on the side of the opponents of lost causes, specifically the southern opponents of lost causes. But we'll, it'll, it'll right. take us a little while to get to get to get to that. Just to kind of like, you know, dispel some of those concerns. I think it's fair to say there are quite a few different historiographies as to the Civil War and Reconstruction in the South. Right. And so and uh, the loss the the, the, the the lost cause is most important because it's the first of these okay right. and it's in in many ways the argumentation over this okay it spreads this is a very problematic thing for the Yankees because like I said this narrative is very effective okay it's so effective that by 1877 despite uh, a brutal campaign of you know, political repression. This lost cause lionizing figure by the name of General Wade Hampton becomes governor of South Carolina. And over the course of a couple of years, he and his paramilitary group called the Red Shirts have waged a particularly violent anti-federal campaign out in the hinterland of South Carolina, like up in the upcountry and in Sumter County and, you know, down towards Hampton County, which is, of course, named after him, uh, not named after him, it's named after his family. But um, they, you, Wade Hampton becomes governor of South Carolina. He's either governor or senator, I can't remember. And now he has a national platform and he starts 
threatening to do the same thing he did in South Carolina to the entire rest of the country. And after years and years of mounting body counts, increasingly, increasingly negative press uh, for the radical Republican governments after, you know, charges of waste, fraud and abuse, essentially, that uh, really offended the fickle imaginations of the, you know, of the Yankee mugwumps that were more or less footing the bill for Reconstruction at the time. Wade Hampton's threat to resecede succeed, succeeds in bullying the U.S. government into pulling out its uh, pulling out its, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, its occupying troops. And that year at Mardi Gras, um, the theme of and this is one of the reasons why Mardi Gras is such an important, you know, calendar event. And it used to be more important throughout the whole South, but it's very important in Louisiana. And this this. Uh, Mardi Gras of 1877 was one of the re- because it was like sort of like the South's victory party. Uh, they made they made Verena Davis the the um, wife of con- of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. They made her queen of Mardi Gras, and they had a they had like a two month party under the moniker and the theme of the Aryan race. Okay, <laughs> so like that's the that's the that's the the tenor of the country whenever these federal troops finally pull out. And one of the things that sort of happened, and this is, it had really infiltrated Northern political thinking so intently that when it it came time to create the um, official history of the American, of the, of it's the war of the rebellion is what it's called. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Some people who are listening may have seen it before because it's well, a lot of people probably aren't familiar with the fact that there is, in fact, a, an official history of the War of the Rebellion. And one of the reasons you're not familiar with it is because it takes up an entire wall. It's essentially a primary document collation. But an incredible thing happened. And this is we're used to this because we've lived with 150 or so years of this kind of mild schizophrenia with the way the civil war is approached where we uh, tend to want to you, you will not find another country whose official history of their civil war inc- includes primary documents and input from the side that lost okay that's the the, the extent to which the northern narrative of, of America, of really of American history, and especially of the history of 1861 to 1865, that's how badly they've been BTFO'd, is that they're being pressured by their own citizens to give the Confederates a chance to tell their side of the story in the U.S. government's official history of its destruction of the Confederate government. Okay, so that's that's an incredibly unusual situation. And politically, it's probably as far as a right-wing insurgency has ever gotten towards taking total power in the United States. Like this is not like if if you're an if you're an advocate of the United States and the union in particular, this lost cause narrative, especially from the between the years of 1868 to 1880 or so. This is something that you deal with every day, okay? And you're every day you're struggling with the fact that not only has this inspired a massive, violent um, insurgency across the defeated Confederacy, it is now bleeding its way into northern states, okay? And so, right. They had to, Before we move off from that uh, point, I would just like to invite anyone else listening to think of any other civil war that may come to mind. And think about the side winning, you know, including the primary documents and uh, the the other side, basically, in their official history. Uh, just just to kind of like show how almost inconceivably uh, zany this is. Like like this is a uh, this is news to me. I didn't realize they did that. I knew there was an official history. I just did not know that it was a. Uh, is it fair to say it was sympathetic in including all the. Uh, Oh yeah, it was. And I mean, it, this was okay. The heart, this group of people that I'm about to start calling the Harvard mafia. And this is where, uh, you know, dissident right historiography starts getting, starts getting interested in the topic, I think. Um, but it was very controversial among Harvard professors. Now it's also important to remember that at the time Harvard is not the universal, actually Harvard is in what it calls it internally. It calls its own dark age, um, which is this, the, this period where it, the, a lot of these elite universities that we think of as elite universities today 
are not yet elite universities. They're like kind of like city colleges. They're you know so at the time Harvard is really it's the it's the college for the children of rich kids and of rich families in Boston. But at at Harvard, you know, which I mean, this does it has quite a bit of standing as a result of this, but it's not like the the global mega corporation that it is today with like a you know 31 billion dollar nine i think it's like 91 billion dollar endowment or anything like that this is you know it's more like a regular college that a lot of uh influential people went to the harvard faculty was incensed a lot of northern politicians one of the most uh, one of the most vociferous opponents of including the rebel documents was um the still living General William Tecumseh Sherman, okay, and who had, you know, and we know Sh Sherman's family were very active in American politics after the war. He was a very uh, popular figure, and even he, even his influence isn't enough to to stamp out this this idea that we need to uh, we need to tell this story from the perspective of these people. And the problem is, is that okay. In the intervening time, one of the things Yankees have done is they've interacted with black people in a way that they frequently hadn't before, either through military service or through, you know, the early stages of what were going to be called the Great Migration. And from their perspective, especially if their union was, this is one of the, one of the big pushes for the inclusion of Confederate documents in the official history of the war, though it does come from, it comes from union soldiers who have, con, especially white union uh, generals who were involved after the war in the occupation of the American South. Winfield Scott Hancock's probably the most famous of these. And are you all familiar? Are you, are you turnipseed familiar with who William, with who Winfield Scott Hancock was? Yes, but once again, I'm not going to. Assume, we're in civil right. war, uh, territory, so I'm not going to assume that the audience does. So, if you could give right. us a, a brief summary for why, yeah, real, real brief. He's the he's the, the, the Yankee uh, in the uh, he's the Yankee in the in the movie Gettysburg that on the last day of the charge, the Confederate general Louis Lou Armistead, who's making the charge across the field, that's his best friend that's on the other side. Okay, so and Winfield Scott Hancock is one of the best Union field commanders of the war. Eventually rises to corps commander after the war. And then one of the things about Hancock that's interesting is he was a Democrat. Okay, and he uh, and after the war, he from his position as a member of the occupying Confederate government, he was in New Orleans. He's a federal. He's a federal occupier who turns low key pro Southerner in in the course of his service in reconstruction, he starts, he starts lifting some of the draconian restrictions on white Southerners. And I, and I didn't, I didn't emphasize this enough. Okay. The, after 1868, um, under the really radical military occupation and reconstruction, white Southerners who had joined the who, white Southerners who had participated in the Confederate army, this is virtually all white men in the South. They're disenfranchised. They're not allowed to have guns. They can have their property confiscated uh, by a military tribunal for little or no reason. Okay, so it's bad. And right, Winfield's right. Well, and I mean that's underselling it a little bit because there were confiscations even without trial, and which, if I remember correctly, I think that was a lot of farmers. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you remember a lot of accounts of farmers saying that Union soldiers would just seize things, their crops, yeah, yeah. property, or tools. I can have. I can has that. Right. Um, so, <laughs> right. Like, this is, and then have it rationed back to them after the Union soldiers would use with it for whatever reason they wanted to. Right. And so through a lot of pressure from one of the things that the northern public, especially the, the Republican Party, which has been running the United States as a junta for the last 15 or so years, one of the things they have to tangle with is the fact that they've lost this this. You know, they won the first civil war. They won the hot war. They really lost Reconstruction. And one of the things they have to contend with is the fact that the South's idea, ideas about race in particular, have largely won over the Northern population. And the Republicans and the um, the the 
children of the abolitionists who have, you know, who who fought in this war, um, they come together and they decide that they need to do something different. They need their, you know, literally that scene from uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, where it's like we need to get us our own midget, and they um, they get together and they create a counter narrative starting in about the eight, starting in about the 1880s. The reason I'm pausing here, this is the second major school of Civil War historiography that emerges as an attempt to sort of dialectically supersede the prevailing lost cause tendency. Um, it was largely a group of historians at Harvard University in particular who are um, who are involved in it. And this is the story that comes down to us as the as the it comes down to us through most of y'all, I assume, through Curtis Yarvin as the ultra the ultra Calvinist thesis, which is the idea that um, that really the North was always the United States, and it's this very romantic, flowery uh, history that really centers New England and New English political history. Uh, as it figures into the story of the United States and paint, manages to kind of somewhat paint the Confederacy as a, you know, an upstart rebellion by the anti-American slave power. Um, right. And this is, this historiography, as you mentioned, centers it on New England. Uh, this would be very similar to what I certainly got in my history class, where you start American history primarily centered on uh, the New English Puritans, and then everything just sort of grows out from them is the way they will teach it. And then by the time you get to the South, Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia eventually being opened up to white Anglicans, pushing out to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, they're kind of treated as like, oh, well, New England was the original Americans. And now we have the Southerners that have just gone out, they're isolated, they're interacting with different people, they have different landscapes. So they've kind of changed from the New England's that's how it usually gets taught, at least uh, where I'm at. Uh, that uh, that centeredness on New England, uh, really, ju they start teaching American history from it, and then everything just emanates from it. It's kind now of how. See, now let's see. This is the, the, here's an interesting interesting thing about the way history is taught. Okay, so in this, because I'm from the very deep south, I'm from you know, I'm from New Orleans, and um, the way. The way this comes, the way history is taught in Southern universities is that you, especially for history majors, the history survey course is divided. And this is the American history survey. That's the general, the, usually the hotshot professors teach this course because this is, you get 36 lectures to teach half of American history to about a thousand students. Okay, so, you know, you're really touching hearts and minds here. And uh, the Southern version, the version of it that is prevalent at Southern colleges is American history, 1607 to 18, 1877. Okay. Right. And uh, the prevailing version of it in Northern universities is 1607 to 1865. And so what Northern universities try to do is they will, they, they will try to, collapse reconstruction into a kind of saddle time that occurs at the very end of one semester and the very beginning of another when students aren't paying attention because they did right. it usually, yeah, they, they, did, they didn't want you to know about that part you know okay. right exactly so i i noticed that when i was looking around at uh different universities a year ago um i noticed that different um american history courses uh, if i were to take it because i was considering uh majoring in history at the time i noticed some universities would end at the end of Reconstruction that first semester, and other ones would end at the end of the Civil War uh, that first semester. So, I, I didn't like uh, it. Didn't necessarily stand out to me as like, wow, they are being very, uh, or wow, we have two different historiographies being taught here. I just kind of noticed it and thought, well, that's a bit strange. But well, it's, it's it's not necessarily, and neither of these historiographies are dominant at the moment, and and they're right. both about to they're both about to get obliterated, and then they make a comeback. But um, the the um the thing that's sort of interesting to to note is that um what we have is a history of the civil war that is based makes very little attempt to actually is very consciously trying to attempt to change 
the reasons that the that the Civil War was fought, and it successfully does. But then it's countered with this what I'm calling I call it it's the the New England the New England centered narrative, but I'll call it the ultra Calvinist thesis because Moldbug uses it as a negative. But when this thing was originally written, that was like a, like it was like li- it's like this it would take it's that Moldbug like essay. That. Yeah, it would take that mold bug essay and say this, but from the right, you know, um, <laughs> the, 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 it was considered a good thing. But one of the things it shares with Lost Cause historiography is that it doesn't ever make any real attempt to conform itself to like unfortunate tidbits, like the fact that the first 50 years of American history are so referred to as the Gen- the Virginia dynasty. Okay. So like, okay, that's, <laughs> your, your story's bullshit too. But one of the things that's important to recognize here is that some combination of these two, ev- of, of these two historiographical narratives of these two different versions of specifically of these two versions of American history that are designed to politically control the way American discourse around the Civil War moved in the late 19th century are uh, these two narratives largely color the way Americans, especially boomer cons, want to think about the Civil War and neither of them are right. And what's what's more interesting is that in their attempt to retcon specific narratives about uh, about Civil War history, they end up revising almost all of American history, you know, okay, and so now you have this, there's, so we're at the end of the 1890s or so, or as the 1890s dawn, we have professors and social critics and educated Americans uh, as well as because of the advent of some, you know, some real cool stuff like, you know, uh, hot 10 type printing that have made newspaper publishing easier and s- spiked literacy across the entire country. We have really two armed camps who are in real terms, they're more divided over their understanding of American history um, than they were at the start of the civil war. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and neither of these narratives is, particularly true or even particularly interested in being true okay right they uh right it sounds like they both develop their own uh, political theologies and then as such you have to fit the rest of history leading up to that and presumably the outlook to fit that theology otherwise it's going to falter right and so that's more or less okay that's more or less the the narrow story of uh of lost cause the of lost cause theology lost cause historiography in about how long have we been doing this uh so that's 57 minutes okay so that's about that's about the length of a college lecture not just really not not just real uh not just real in depth unfortunately because it's too easy to get it's real easy to get off in the weeds on the uh, on this stuff but the next thing that you need to know about civil war historiography and its relation to the to the to the lost causes that Something happens in, and this is very interesting because it's not the way people generally remember it. Okay. Something happens where American universities get very interested in German theories of, in well, really German methods of writing history. And they adopt, they send, we send a bunch of guys, especially from Columbia University, we send them to Germany to go study under this aging man who has pioneered the study of history. And he's generally considered the founder of history as we understand it today. His name is Leopold von Ranke. Um, and he's a like like categorical positivist in like every like formal sense of the term. And what comes out is he, you know, he mentors these people, or in his his and he was very old at the time. Actually, he may have been dead. It may have been his students that were teaching these Americans that go over there. Um, they take the first degrees in history and they come back and they want to establish history programs in American universities. One of the things that they've done is they've they've taken from Von Ranke this idea that documentary evidence is incredibly important to the study of history, okay? That we need to be, it, to be able, and you can see what I mean by positivism. This is basically scientism creeping into, uh, creep, creep, creeping into, the, into the humanities. Right. 
and it, they, they they come up with this idea that if we're going to say something about the past, what we need to do is be able to go back into past documents and substantiate our claim with um, some evidence that indicates that you know we're not just reading sheep and trails, or uh, and most of these guys are Southerners. Okay. And so this is, this is where, this is where something, another event, another school of historiography, historiography starts to emerge that this is really the one that the left hates. Okay. And in order, one of the reasons why you see the lost cause stuff coming up now, coming up over and over again from the left is because they want to be able to smear what they refer to as the historical inaccuracies of the lost cause onto this other group of historians who, from their perspective, were far more damaging. Okay, And this is a group of historians that gathered at Columbia University under the tutelage of a man named William Archibald Dunning. OK, and this is this is the the infamous Dunning School where this is this is one of these situations where people who have no interest in academic history whatsoever will occasionally be harangued with like mentions of the Dunning School, because this is the I mean, this is this is the the Ur demon in the mind of the modern leftist historians uh, imagination. And they didn't write about the Civil War again. And frequently they were against lost cause. They, they were revising lost cause narratives. They tended to focus on reconstruction itself. So they're historians of the history of the, the period that the lost cause narrative was most active in. And one of the things that they do is they push back against this New England Harvard mafia bit. And they even push back against the bourbon Democrat narrative quite a bit, which, you know, makes these makes these extraordinarily noble claims and that the South was a golden age aristocracy. And it, it makes the argument that the Southerner was the average Southerner was a yeoman farmer, you know, who, who didn't hurt nobody. And he is mostly engaged in farming. And then he has to go fight this war. Again, they're not just real interested in the war usually, but they do take a mildly pro-Southern stance. Uh, they take uh, really the same stance that's still contemporary today in like German, in like countries that don't really pay much attention to the Civil War, but they do have an official narrative about it. And like, so they, they, you still find German historians. They'll, they'll say, well... It looks like this war was going to happen because of flaws in the Constitution. But after the war, the Southern people are absolutely abused by um, occupying Negroes and um, uh, Northern financiers for the most part. Northern capitalists, you know, this is not a particularly pro-capitalist group of people either. Um, and they, they do something that no other group of historians has ever done before. And that's they create a unified body of thought down to the fact that the, the titles of their books are frequently in line with one another. So it's going to be reconstruction in Alabama, reconstruction in Louisiana, reconstruction in Georgia, you know, a, a history of reconstruction in the United States, um, you know, a new history of the United States. Um, and they, they're using documentary evidence, especially newspapers and especially these you know, primary journals that have been uh, in newspaper, like news reports and from both the North and the South. And they paint Reconstruction as one giant continuous train of abuses on the Southern people. And when people come to them and say, that's bullshit, bro. They're like, look, dude, I got, I, you know, I've seen the documents, you know, and <laughs> we have, we have empirical evidence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so this is really the dawn of, formal historical study in the United States. Like it, what we right. think of, what we think of as like legitimate historical study in the United States was an attempt by some Southern like spreadsheet gurus in the early, in the early, in, you know, in the early 20th century to uh, get this idea about the civil war, right. And one of the things that we're going to come, one of the conclusions that we, you know, we come to is that, you know, whatever happened that the, the south has been badly mistreated in the in the years since the war this was an argument made by a politician uh, uh, one of these uh one of these dunning school historians 
who had political ambitions at the time he was you know he wasn't at columbia he was at princeton he was president of president of princeton university and in 1910 he starts getting this idea he's going to run for president. His name's Woodrow Wilson. Right. Okay. So this is this right. is one. This is another one of these things. The, the Dunning the Dunning school of historians uh, gives us Woodrow brings Woodrow Wilson to the you know to the presidency, uh, and it generally revises positively the narrative of American history in favor of the South. And it stays that way till the 1940s or so. Right. Before we move on, uh, because Wilson and then everything that comes after is probably going to be the uh, the turning point for the discussion that we're having here. Right. Uh, just just so that we can answer a few questions before they come up. Uh, what was history like before the more empirically minded uh, Dunning School uh, brought in? Their excessive use of uh, firsthand accounts. Their excessive use of like. <laughs> uh, we, we I, need I, more. We need more. Trust me, bro. Um, you're right. What, so yeah, what what was it like beforehand? Because most people today, if I were to hazard a guess, would think that history has always just been look at the firsthand accounts. You know, the no. people there pile them together, and then we can see what happened. But. Uh, I'm You're making the Alex. I'm, I'm making the Alex Jones face right now because there is there is right, there is right, like so. it's like right right before I drop the documents. Okay, <laughs> you all are probably more familiar with the with this mode of this pre source based mode of historiography than you than you are aware of because both Karl Marx and Thomas Carlyle are excellent examples of it. Which okay, is this right. is a, this is like a, a romantic or an ideological history, and so what the main purpose of historical narratives in the early 19th century was, was to create a justification for an ideological system that you were creating. So this is a quote, theory of history, unquote, like in the German idealist sense. And so that is the first American historian to do this was this guy by the name of George Bancroft, who was a, he was a Massachusetts Yankee who in the uh, 1830s studied in, he went to university and guess where? Where did he go to university? Why don't you? It was Germany. <laughs> and so he uh, he had imported this kind of what is frequently American historiography will refer to as religious history. But that's kind of a snide use of the word religious. It's a like a sort of a priori history is the best way to is the best way to write it. The best way to you know think about it that, you know, um, our heavenly kingdom versus their barren wastes and that's the narrative that everything is going to fit into so the primary purpose right. of history so. is to justify our hatred of another people whether it be the bourgeoisie whether it be the french whether it be you know the peasantry and you'll get a lot of stuff like the great man theory of history is a perfect example of like let's like okay like with thomas carlisle source trust me bro like that's right. like, well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it could be said that this, uh, the Dunning School, uh, was the shift from a history of narratives to something that is trying to be much more empirical. Uh, yeah. All the bad connotations that empirical has attached to it. Uh, right. Something a bit closer to what you would recognize to be uh, normal history today. Yeah. And this is what the left has always been really frankly ass mad about this because they like and this is this is the reason every you don't even you're not a southern historian i just it's what i was studying so eventually that was going to run into these guys no way around it um but the even like you, american american studying like byzantine history will still have to occasionally learn about the dunning school because the left is so ass mad that it's actually the right that invented this is what we think of as the american right today Though at the time they called themselves progressives again, uh, but there was a controversial claim embedded in there. But uh, at the time they, they called themselves either the progressive historians or the new historians. But they've kind of come down to us as the as the as the Dunning School, and uh, yeah, they invent they establish the modern practice of history for the specific purpose of BTFOing a bunch of Harvard Yankees. Um, and so that's 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 how history was born. And it's like I said, this narrative remained salient until the 1930s or so. And here's an interesting thing is that during this period, really from 1870 to about 1920, Confederate imagery almost disappears from like I said, these are his this is historical wrangling about 
reconstruction rather than the confederacy itself confederate flags and that sort of thing almost totally disappeared from the really the the, the public sphere as you know that you that you would uh, in the sense that you would think of it and they don't re they don't reemerge until the 1930s or so when uh the second the second ku klux klan starts to use them as like it starts to use it as a nativist symbol and so that's when that's kind of when you know the the use of the star not the stars and bars the uh first battle flag uh right. starts to reemerge in american politics but for for this period from about 18 1900 we'll say to because okay, so teddy roosevelt who's you know, his, I think his, was his uncle or something was in the Confederacy. Teddy Roosevelt loved the Confederacy. Woodrow Wilson's father was a fire eating Presbyterian preacher who was one right. of the guys that, that caused the civil war to happen. you know, was involved in starting the civil war. You can Just, imagine how he felt. For, um, for those that don't know in the audience, uh, could you briefly explain what a fire eater was? Oh, okay. Now, but the, that's the interesting thing is the fire eaters, that's something that really happened. So that's, that's the history of how the civil right. war happened, which right. we haven't talked about but, at all, it, you know, and you're right and, there. I, I just wanted to make sure that people that, that seemed like just an adjective, but it's, it's not. And for anyone in the audience, that right. Does, a uh, fire eater was a fire eater was a Southern demo demagogue is one way to put it in the formal sense. It's right. But it's, it was an influential Southern writer, social critic, preacher, politician, who between the years of 1848 and 1860 advocated with increasing urgency and uh, and persuasiveness for the secession of the Southern states. Man, that was a perfect definition. Right. Uh, <laughs> the coffee is kicking in. I was about to say the only thing that you could possibly add to that was that, like sometimes they went beyond secession and into like just expanding it across the whole uh, all the new territories as well. Yeah, uh, that group of people existed. Yeah, and well, the fire eaters tended to be in that group of people. They're very expansionist. Right. So because the Philip standard fire eater is a Presbyterian preacher, uh, you know, some sort of gold seeking filibuster, or a you know, or someone who's got a lot of slaves. And a lot of times there's a lot of crossover between those between between those groups of people. Um, right. and and I'll, I'll give the brief uh, definition this time, a filibuster uh, in this context for anyone that is outside of the United States and does not know our, this is rather esoteric, I found. I found that this doesn't get taught. Filibusters in the United States since were, uh, I, I almost want to call them conquerors. What they would do is they would travel to usually countries south of our border that were much smaller, had less organized governments, and try to take them over in the pursuit of uh, typically, I believe it was like natural resource rights and trading powers. Oh, uh, that's a that's a that that's a very sanitary definition. That's like right, you, so, you, like you have stuff like okay, oh they 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 went to countries that weren't the United States and did this stuff. It's oh okay, how did we get Texas? How did we get Louisiana? How right, did we so, get you know? <laughs> right, it, it was, was official policy at one point, man. <laughs> you know, yeah, they did this uh, successfully, and those uh, examples that you just mentioned, they did it unsuccessfully, and a few other ones. Uh, I guess you could call Cuba the long con, uh, being as it didn't immediately work, but eventually we got it. Uh, but also Honduras, Nicaragua, they got major influence there, but they never actually uh, succeeded in bringing them into the union. Now, or here we go, because you, you brought up the Spanish-American War here. So what, right. when did when when was the Spanish-American War? That would be 1898. 1898. Okay, and then the ex the extended occupation into what we're what we term the progressive history. Right. Remember how I said that the South has actually thoroughly won this narrative by the late by the late 19th century. The South has so thoroughly won this narrative that it becomes official U.S. policy under the Roosevelt administration to annex Cuba and Puerto Rico. Right. Okay, so the, yeah. the filibusters finally win. And, and, and this is the, another one of these things. This is The left doesn't want you to know this, that, you know, they, they don't want you to know this. Uh, but but, but the, uh, the middle period of like this, this early 20th century period of American history actually sees the cultural causes of the, the cultural attitudes that the Confederacy had really become dominant in the United States. And so it like the Confederacy sort of reaches from beyond the grave and seizes control of the federal government in this in in this the, this really strange scene from about 1890 to about really up to 
up to it doesn't it doesn't finally fall apart until the FDR administration until we get into World War II, which is that's the the next the next cons- the topic is consensus history is the next school of historiography. Right, and I just figured I would show this, being as uh, you were talking about how successful it was. This is a uh, campaign poster for the McKinley Roosevelt administration, uh, specifically uh, talking about going from Spanish rule in Cuba, as you can see in the bottom left, to American rule in Cuba in the bottom right. And obviously it has all the same old, uh, I don't want to say rhetorical tricks because this isn't writing, but the visual tricks, as you can see, Spanish rule in Cuba as it's still made out in mainstream uh, history today, as it's being taught, at least uh, when I was in high school, it was terrible. Disease proliferated the island. People were being locked up for no reason. It was complete and utter terror. And then on the bottom right, you can see American Cuba. People have market stalls. They're properly clothed and fed. Uh, the progressive, uh, or well, I suppose that might be a slight anachronism, but the, uh, the administration there has uh, completely just turned around Cuba into something resembling civilization. I made a mistake and read the comments and Tuesday FA Tuesday says Nicaragua grows the best tobacco these days. When I, on my drive home from work yesterday, I, I smoked the Tatuaje Clonu and it was all Nicaraguan. And that was one of the best cigars I've ever had. So I, I, I'm in concurrence Nick, and I'm drinking Nicaraguan coffee now. So like, that's like a, that, that if, if you were wondering where my positionality is, I'm pro filibuster. You know? Right. So, yeah, yeah, and this is a this was a nice tangent from the uh, fire eaters as well because there's a lot of a uh, this isn't even necessarily esoteric history. This will get ta- this is like a sentence in history books if you look close enough. So it hasn't been completely expunged just yet. I don't think from uh, what you might find in a good high school textbook, but people most certainly don't know about it. Figured it would right. uh, go over it. So in the 1940s, what sort of happens is, and and I don't want to get too off in the weeds about like sort of, you know, like communist infiltration into the FDR administration, that sort of thing. We all know it happened. We all know, we all, we all know it happened. But one of the, one of the outgrade, one of the outgrowths of this is that, um, American policy starts to Europeanize itself in, in an unusual way. And, as a result of some groups like uh, some names people are familiar with, like Edward Bernays and um, oh, who is the Lippmann. Okay. These people who have like started to like totalize the state in the United States, of course they're communists, but the um, they start coming up with the idea that we need to, first of all, We've lost this narrative if we allow empirical evidence about the Civil War and Reconstruction to stand on its own, because I, everybody more or less agreed at this is like the Dunning School one. OK, like these guys, it's like, right. OK, this it turns uh, out they had an extreme preponderance of damning evidence against. The <laughs> yeah. 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 And so the, they decide that they're going to start as one of the New Deal reforms, they're going to start kind of weapon re-weaponizing history as a political as a unified political cudgel or national policy and this is in the period after so like all of the where you start to see harvard and columbia and stanford and a new university called chicago university of chicago start to produce these figures that are at one time on one hand they're historical scholars on the other hand as soon as they graduate college as soon as they graduate from grad school they get sucked straight into the state department and they they're mostly like one of the things they're doing is they're producing memos on like oh the history of you know american trade with southern china and like and they you know become the author of official policy on american trade in southern china the next main school of historiography is drawn largely from these people. Okay. And they're referred to today as the consensus historians. And this is not to say that they're bad by any means. A lot of them are excellent. Their consensus history has, is almost as much of a pejorative as Dunning school or lost cause in the historical profession, but they're, you know, their narratives aren't that bad. And what they're mainly interested in doing is they're tired of this rupture that exists over this, this explanation of how the Civil War happened. They're tired of this. Are they're t- the, the United States is at war with fascism, the worst thing in history. 
in the last the worst thing in six million years of history is fascism and it, evil yeah yeah and it and it and it's time for the american people to you know unify behind something and so one of the things this is a world world war ii great depression world war ii era um policy initiative to create a narrative of american history that more or less doesn't stand on anybody's toes okay so like in many ways, it's a return of this earlier type of history that like uh, Carlisle and Bancroft were writing because, it again, it de-emphasizes um, primary source documents. Um, and this is where the, because there's a lag of about 30 or 40 years between the time a historical narrative enters the, you know, enters the elite universities and the time it becomes, it trickles down and becomes a and becomes a more or less popular understanding there is uh, th th this is the one that boomers are more or less in inculcated with especially boomer cons and so like though they're going to tend to want to read the civil war is like you know it's a both sides <laughs> there were good people on both sides like so literally when donald when donald trump talks about history like you know his both sides -ism, that's like a reflect. He's almost a perfect reflection of what we think of as consensus history. So, like you know, that's also the version of history that's going to start including words like classical liberal enlightenment values, and, and in the main because they don't. I, I don't know. Some new immigrants might have showed up with their own ideas. I don't know what happened, but the <laughs> the main the main thing that sort of happens is that um we kind of simplify the narrative of american history so that people don't have as much stuff to argue about it's like why are we arguing about why the american revolution happened let's just agree that it's a good thing um and that is the dominant like course of history for what is probably probably into the 1950s the next one that creeps in is the new left and this is the right um, before we get there just to recap uh, <laughs> we start off with the lost cause then we get the harvard historiography kind of yeah. encounter. then we get the official narrative which uh the lost cause as you hinted at had just completely taken over uh, it was a sounding success by making its way into the official narrative right. then we get the Gunning school which starts bringing in empirical evidence uh, turns out, with the uh, massively brutal occupation of the South, the empirical evidence was overwhelmingly pro-Confederate. And then, as as a uh, not as a response, but trying to smooth over the divides, we get the uh, the consensus history. Uh, right which... now, well, you know, I think the consensus history is probably worth teasing this out for like the the, the people who are more interested in the meta narrative. They there are so many of them. Okay, because the you know the demand for public intellectuals expands horizontally so much as the bureaucratic state expands in the roosevelt administration there's a scale difference between consensus history and the even the dunning school that came before it that really allows them to just win the argument by drowning out the noise that the compet that their competitors can make so like we're like seeing like like two three hundred percent increase in the number of people that we would consider hit, you know consensus historians as opposed to like the Dunning School which was like ten guys you know okay so like right. there's this is like literally there's like this is the State Department pumping propaganda directly you know or like directly through Hollywood um, versus like ten guys that write books. Okay, so, right. like, so <laughs> it, it, it shed light on you know how the consensus uh, historiography took over, but you know it also kind of elevates the Dunning School because you know it took uh, the entire State Department to uh, right. supersede them. Like, sounds yeah, like it. the Dunnings is in terms of historiography, the Dunning School they're they're like they're the they're the world's super soldiers, like uh, and like to this to this day. Google Dunning School. Like, just go read the Wikipedia page on Dunning School and see how hard the smear job is against these guys. Like, it like it right. continues to stay. The Atlantic Magazine two years ago published a hit piece on Woodrow Wilson. He's been dead for a hundred years. You know, it's like right. it's like you got to got you got to you got to keep stamping on this guy. You know, I, uh, like you can usually judge uh, the what the Wikipedia article is covering, how good that subject is, uh, based on how hard the smear campaign against it is. Yeah. Is what I've been. Age. Right. Um, 
before we move on to the new left and all that, while we're still in the 30s and the 40s and all that, and hopefully we don't get uh, taken down for talking about this, uh, right. I hope you... We're going to wait. We're going to take it down. We're going to take it down for your shit I've already said <laughs> without th without thinking about it. So, I, uh, I hope that you uh, know what I'm talking about. There was a... Uh, I forget which part of the federal government did this, uh, but there was a campaign to interview former slaves in the 30s, uh, and they... Uh, famously took transcripts of the conversations with them, and they're quite damning of a lot of modern historiography. Yeah. Um, and, and you have arguments <laughs> against the damning part, um, because the former slaves were reminiscing about their enslavement and how much, uh, well, or how better taken care of they were than in Great Depression United States as a freedman. Uh, who, oh, yeah. well, does this tie into anything that we've discussed so far? Because oh, we have well, school historiography, and uh, this is transcripts being gathered by the ins yeah okay there so. you go that's the, the the most important thing that's going on there is that is that fixation with hard actionable evidence okay it's like okay i have this guy right here who was a slave under jefferson davis who was telling me that jefferson davis jefferson davis was a good man you know also it's like okay now you want to go now you want to go say you want to go publish a book or something that says jefferson davis his slaves hate him okay I ain't gonna do that, you know. <laughs> it's like we got this guy that was a slave for Jefferson Davis. Um, but one of the things, and this is also to, okay, so much of what you think of as like modern historical analysis was created specifically to get around the Dunning School arguments. Okay, and so like the 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 thing you usually hear about these slave narratives, first of all, what they do is they just try to hide them. Like you're, you're only supposed to know, right. you're not, you're not supposed to know how extensive these collections are. You're just supposed right. to know about the ones that said the stuff that they wanted you to say. I remember if, this if, because, uh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I just want to, uh, just to like kind of uh, highlight how much they suppressed this. The first time I heard about this was in my U.S. history class. Um, we get to like the 30s or whatnot. We just, we talk about like the great migration that started and preceding it in the 20s and all this other stuff. Uh, and we get told, oh yeah, by the way, this is the around the time that they start uh, writing down transcripts of the formerly enslaved now that a few generations have passed. Uh, and oh, they hated it. It was terrible. So this finally put, uh, just blows a hole into anything coming out of the South uh, historiography wise. And so I go home and I th I think, well, you know, I want to read these. This sounds interesting. I didn't know that we like had transcripts of people that were enslaved going into the 30s. Uh, and it's not at all how they made it out to me in their teaching. I find a couple that were damning towards the slave, slave owners. Um, but quite a lot of what I see in like the 30 page preview that I get uh, was, you know, people reminiscing. Like it, it sounds like uh, being able to steadily provide food and shelter for these people uh, was a good thing compared to what the uh, Depression era America could offer them. And then later come to find out there's a lot more than just 30 pages of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. There's like just dozens surprised. and dozens of hours. Somebody's going to use the word. I said the Spanish word for I said the Spanish word for black. Yeah, I do. I'm real bad about that, actually, because they were OK. The, been reading these Dunning School sources to get ready, you know, just to refamiliarize myself, and that's the word they used. So it was stuck in my head. I, don't, I hope I hope I don't get the whole channel yeeted. Right. Well, I might have to go through this and edit mm -hmm. it after afterwards. But I, I think we'll right. be fine. We're on the radar just yet. I'm, just label it education. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just right, citing. I'm you. citing the document. See, that's see, that's the kind of thing. Okay. According to a Dunningite school theory of history, you should be able to do that. The left's like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. But no, uh, the, yeah, the, the the next, the most important one, and this is really interesting because so much of the dissident right narrative reminds me in the main of new leftist narratives. Right. Which so, is, which is, I think the, this might be good to go over if we highlight first your summary of what the distant right narrative is and then without commenting just move into the new left and see if we get uh any sort of uh similarities that can be drawn just well by i i think that might be a good exercise but if you think not then go ahead well i mean yeah the new left is a, a group of again mostly tweety harvard types that started to, to harvard 
Uh, some of these guys are still around. You can email them and they'll talk to you. Like Noam Chomsky's one of them. Um, they're like a lot of these no northeastern based, like you know, in in intellectuals that are they really despise this Atlanticist stuff, and they think it's fascism, and they're kind of right. But the <laughs> the um, they really start to develop a lot of the, for instance, that that bit that I grabbed from uh, about reconstruction being a resistance narrative. Okay, whenever you start thinking of when you if you're familiar with the language of uh, colonized peoples, the subaltern um, hegemony. Uh, which, of course, is derived from the Italian elitist eventually by, by way of uh, Antonio Gramsci. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can see the look on my face. I'm like, eh, you know, this is y'all, man. But um, it, it, this is not to say they're, they're, they're not bad people by any means. A lot of them were incredible historians. And, 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 uh, but one of the things that, 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 they're, that they're doing here is they're borrowing in some cases. It, this is their problem with the Civil War is that they've run into, okay, for instance, this colonizer narrative. Um, they they look at Reconstruction and they say, "Huh, that looks like a subal that looks like an oppressed people uh, forming spontaneous resistance uh, clusters and you know establishing a liberation narrative." Okay, so we've got to do again. It's like a, the, the, you know, we've we've got to contain that somehow because right, yeah, it's the wrong side doing it. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because at the same time we're on that we're they are more interested in the reason the Harvard Mafia stuff has like kind of returned as the the baseline narrative for history. That's it. There's a the reason I was kind of like iffy about that earlier because there is a sharp discontinuity between the 1880s and the 1960s when this, when this sort of stuff starts to creep back into the narrative. Um, and it's in the main because of the ongoing hit ongoing civil rights movement and, you know, and, 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 and this sort of thing. But um, wait, hold on, back me up 10 seconds. I got ahead of myself. What, what, what right. was I, what was I saying a second ago? <laughs> well, uh, we were talking about how the new left was uh, seeing that there might be a anti-colonial resistance uh, narrative right. in uh, re Reconstruction era South, uh, but right. that's the wrong side because they were also the evil racist whites. They're the yeah, they're the evil racist whites. This is the first gen. Th they are Marxists. There are there are some aspects of them that are Marxists, and they they'll tend to play this narrative down sometimes, and some of them become less Marxist as you know as time goes on. But uh, like. Some of their most some of their most talented historians also become some of the most famous right wing historians later on in life. So Eugene Genovese, for instance, is a new leftist who writes a book called The Political Economy of Slavery. And if you read this book, he's a Marx. He's a member of the Communist Party. Like he's like on on television at the Rutgers University graduation saying that he welcomes a Viet Cong victory. OK, that's how like that's how like uh, that's how communist this guy is. Um, but he writes this book called Political Economy of Slavery, and you can see him over the course of this text start to really fall in love with the South. And so in the New Left, you get this strange bifurcation in narratives whose their only thing that they really have in common with one another. So like you'll start to see left and right version, kind of a left and right version of New Left history. Um, but the only thing they really have in common is that they despise what they referred to as liberal, what referred to itself as liberal internationalism, which is what consensus history was created to justify. Um, they created two pejorative words for what these people call them. So they called themselves liberal internationalists. The new left came up with two separate pejorative words for them, which were the first one was Atlanticist and the second one was globalist. Okay, so these are the guys. These are the guys I that invented see. the word. Yeah. These are the guys that invented the word globalism, um, and they. Some of them tend to break in favor of, and this is a weird bifurcation. Like I said, some of them tend to break in favor of, like the abolitionist movement, um, which up until this point has not really been 
much of a focus on any like the abolitionist movement was something that was formally not very interesting until the new left kind of made it into a thing um you see generally uh, from them you see a return to a history that is based very much on new england patterns of development uh, New England's history, again, becomes the history of America. And when that's taught in schools today, that's because the teachers that you have in schools today are either the oldest ones were college right. students at the time and, and the yeah. youngest ones, the youngest ones were taught by them. OK, and that's right. the, but that's the it's really the new the new left narrative about the Civil War is the current sort of probably hegemonic one. I don't know if. Really, we're in a period now where there's that we're kind of histor referred to as the breakdown of consensus. So, like, there's the dissident right. The dissident right is able to exist in large measure because there's no prevailing cultural narrative that is dominant in society. You know, so like we, we'll tend to think that it is, and that you know the progressives have a lot of political power, but the po progressives today are considerably less unified than the like relative monolith of American understandings of the world in the late 1950s. Okay. So this right. is, this is where the new left narrative comes from They're that, you know, they think this, they think all this conformity, all this unit unity of narrative, all this consensus building is fascism. And they start join, they start looking for ways to oppose it. And like, it frequently end up adopting, you know, a lot of a lot of Marxist a lot of Marxist tactics. There's going to be a tend to, tendency to focus on New England history, but some of them defect. Okay, especially after 1967, some of them defect and they become the dominant. Paul Gottfried is an example of one of these, um, right. and uh, Eugene Genovese uh, is is probably the other famous example with respect to the South. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I have. I mean, you're you're the one giving me the, the uh, a very nice lecture after all. Uh, but I think it might be worth making the point here for uh, anyone that might not be getting the full picture. It's yeah. very hard to make a historiography that is 100% incorrect and terrible. So everything that we've discussed here, uh, perhaps maybe only one could have extreme condemnation brought about on it. I, I would say, like, we just discussed the new left having come up with the term globalist in response to the... Uh, to the consensus school. Uh, there are many people that I think you and I would say are very much not leftists that will use that language and that idea uh, against their enemies. Uh, much the same with all of these. This isn't to say that they are uh, these historians. No, really, in, in a lot of ways, new left is not a good thing to use. It's not a good thing to use to call them. Um, right. Because they're not, they're um, they're leftists in kind of the American sense, but this is okay. Like they're these people are not orthodox Marxists by any means. Right, exactly. They're they're, they're and, and they really do generally have a lot of um, they do generally have a lot of sympathy for like sort of New England individualism and r rugged individual. One of the main sort of aesthetic themes among the new left is the idea of they're real interested in pushing. You, this is why boomers are so like into like rugged individualism and the cowboy. So like they do like new Western history and they, uh, and you know, they're, they're all kinds of things that are wonderful about these people. But, uh, and their opposition to like what at the time was called Atlanticism is the only thing that right. really, the only thing that really makes them leftist is that in some senses of the word, they became third worldists and they were opposed to America on any grounds whatsoever, right. you know, on idiot, on ideological grounds. That's the only thing that really makes them leftist. I th you know, I think. Right. And, uh, there was something else I was going to bring up as well, but now that thought has completely left me. So uh, forgive me. Uh, continue. No, no problem. Um, and so their, you know, their idea of their idea of what, you know, what happened in the Civil War is you can start to see this breakdown of consensus because there, it, when your when your narrative of history becomes as rel as relativistic as like. What do I need to do to get opposition to get opposition voters to the regime? You know, people who are opposed to the regime 
in a specific place? What do I need to do? What do I need to tell them about American history to get them on board with, you know, my plan to oppose the United States government? And so that's you start to see a consensus breakdown here because on on one hand, see George Wallace and is, George Wallace is a, a figure who kind of has re he absorbed through some of his cleverer speech writers and that were that it, you know were were very intelligent persons. He absorbed some of the countercultural new left tendencies, and that that's one of the reasons that makes his his speeches so electrifying is because they're like perfect opposition. You know, whenever he does this, like you know, draw the line in the dust, the greatest people that have ever trod this earth. You know, right. and when he's when he's doing that, that's is essentially what the new left, what the goals of the new left are. Is they're trying to search for uh, narratives that can unify specific demographics against in political opposition to this is another thing they take from Marx, where so Marx said the, the previously, and it's one of the theses on Feuerbach. He says one of the well, previously the philosophers have only interpreted history. The goal, however, is to change it. So the number one thing that the new left does as a movement is this is the very, very conscious application of grassroots, grassroots um, outreach to affecting political change in the United States using, you know, a managed curated data set in a lot of ways of, 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 of historical topics. But it does because you have to approach these things different ways in different parts of the country. It it does end up causing a breakdown of the total consensus, which is kind of what happened here. And this is always this is the this is the, the version of this story where we assume the Tavistock Institute doesn't exist. And you know, all, you know, you know, this is the yeah. this is this is the clean this is the clean version of this story so, that, yeah, that cons single, consensus no. broke down and nobody pushed it. Okay. Right? Yeah. But, <laughs> but they they do have they have some remarkably based narratives, uh, you know, and they some of them they will tend to avoid reconstruction. So they're one of the things that they're going to do is. Um, They'll oppose lost cause historiography, and they're the ones that really start using lost cause historiography as a blanket statement for everything they don't like as well. Um, they tend to cap, put focus back on the Civil War, and they're going to want to interpret the Civil War as a set of socioeconomic events where usually the narrative is big, nasty slave owners uh, cajoled this subaltern working class population into going to war for hyper capitalism. You know, right, yeah. okay. <laughs> That's the hour version of the rich man's war. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And so that's fun. That's probably of all of the remaining narratives of of you know historiographical narratives, that's probably the one that's most that's most prevalent. And it's mostly interesting in that it fought a sort of another kind of mini war inside the academy with its own right wing uh defectors okay so like at this point all of these consensus historians are like they're they're like dead okay and like um the years it's just the night we're in the 1970s now and like a lot of these guys who had been like countercultural activists in the 19 in the night they've been student activists in the 60s and maybe in the late 50s they're taking tenure track jobs in universities now. And they they're they quick they become they you know they march through this they march through this set of institutions about as quickly as they did the House of Representatives, which is like the class of Watergate class of 1974 is like 68 new right. Democrats that were all like raging communists. Right. But um they so quickly the only you know academia becomes this kind of a war zone between this very dominant group of like new left historians that are basically what you think of as modern shit libs. And then there is this other group of people that kind of think about the world the same way. They're interested in similar stuff. Like, so for instance, the dissident right cottons onto this narrative about, I mean, y'all like that bit when I was talking about, you know, uh, you, you know, colonized peoples and resistance to the, you know, to the blue bellies, you know, like, yeah, I can jive with that. Yeah. That's cause that's your, that's your new left lizard brain is what's going on there. And the, um, it, it, 
really suffused the new left is most interesting that they they totally suffused the American Academy and essentially rewrote American history as instead of one long narrative, it's a constellation of narratives that are competed over in a quote marketplace of ideas. Okay, okay. you know, but this is the right so. and and, so, and uh it in this marketplace of, of ideas, all bets are on the table, especially when if Eugene Genovese's book is better than you, you can go call him a fascist. And like, that'll be enough to like, you, 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 you that'll, that'll do him some damage, you know, or something right. like that. But so uh, even, yeah, but I mean, yeah, it, but their, their work is very good. And generally what I say about new left historians is that a lot, a lot of times the, the first, the first and the last chapter of their books will be awful, but everything in the middle is good. So like they're, they're prone yeah, to doing the starting point for that. <laughs> yeah. Point. But all the other yeah. information. Good. Yeah. They, they do incredible. They did incredible primary source research and they unearthed like just in, in, incredible resources. And then they'll, for most of their writing, they'll adhere to it. And then at the very end, when they realize they don't like their conclusion, they just, they either change what the initial question was, or they just lie in their conclusion. Right. <laughs> and, and in fairness, uh, this sounds like this is our, one of the first, uh, uh, I don't know if it, like non-Marxist socialists writing a major history in the South, uh, would be a way to describe the new left, not the best, but just to kind of set the, uh, yeah. I mean, the, I they are uh, Marxist. They are Marxist enough in this, that, that they do use Marxist theory and like Soviets did have, did Soviets, you know, Soviet types did find them especially useful, especially for, in, you know, furthering the movement, the civil rights movement and, uh, for acting as a, kind of a fifth column inside the anti-regime fifth column inside the United States. So like when they wanted, right. when the United States wants to talk about how it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's the making the world safe for democracy, then the Soviets would kick up a civil rights demonstration in Atlanta. Uh, the governor would qu qu use the national guard to, you know, brutally put down this, this, this black uprising that was just saying is I just want my, you know, I just want my rights. And so, okay. So there are, there are real problems with some aspect, but again, the new left is almost as big, almost as large, almost as it's got the same relationship in size as the consensus history does to the Dunning school. It's gotten even bigger. Okay. So there's, there's, there's so many of them that they, they, they just all, they start to break down. You know, there's, there's plenty of them to like, and there's plenty of them not to like. The reason that I phrase it that way, and this might be a rabbit hole in and of itself that might be deviating ever so slightly from the topic, is that yeah. uh, this would not be the first time that the South or that the South is being covered by uh, by the left, basically, if you could call it that, um, because there is an often forgotten school of uh, I don't know if it's good if it's a uh, all right to call them socialists or not. A non-Marxist socialist might be a better way, uh, much closer to Reconstruction than the New Left is. Uh, that would write his history, and I perhaps you know what I'm talking about. I was just, you were talking about the all that the the sociology, the Chapel Hill sociologist. Is that right. what, yeah. really so, now that is some esoterica, man? Howard right. Howard Odom and the, that that's like see, I I knew that was the right answer, but I did not expect that was the answer you're going to get. I, I I figured it would be good to just throw out there because usually yeah. people see the South as being purely the foothold of the right wing. Um, and there's in like as soon as we get to the 70s and the 80s, that's when the leftists start covering it. And, you know, before then, sometimes we got Union and Confederate scraps over its history. Uh, but so, there's a lot of uh, non Marxist socialism that we can see and especially Southern history uh, that doesn't get talked about ever from what I can see. Like I, I only came across this a few months ago. So uh, would you happen to know enough about it on this uh, shorthand? Uh, yeah. Era? Well the well okay now the the main aim of the of the Howard Odom crew and the and this is I, I've said it I've said this before in the past that the most poisonous university in the world is the University of North Carolina and this is because their their history department to this day their history and socialist sociology departments to this day are I mean it's basically just a gathering point for violent communists and they um 
it was the Chapel Hill sociologists were created really in response to the formation of the the Nashville circle that wrote I'll take my stand is that that's what the the, the most because I'll take my stand is a book that comes down to us now and it's like you know people have a copy of it and they read it and like that was kind of weird but uh at the time it, when it came out it made a big splash in the in the world and it was something that needed a response to and so yeah that's kind of what's going on there um there is a little bit of like glow around the around the, the the Chapel Hill sociologists in the same way that there is around some of the miners in West Virginia, in the sense that they were given money by the Soviets. Because what sort of happens is that from, from like 1918 to like 1930, uh, there's no rules about money, no functional rules about moving money into the United States from the Soviet Union or vice versa. <laughs> okay. Right. And, okay. and, you know, in, in pursuit of the global socialist revolution, like the, they, uh, the Soviets uh, established incredibly intricate networks and, you know, by the 19th, really by the 1940s or so, whenever moving this money back and forth became difficult, they had their own, like, they were already, they, they, you know, they were already profitable. And so they, they you know, they, they, they ran themselves at that point. So there was always um, every, all of this oppositional narrative stuff from the 1920s on has like serious tinges of like Soviet agitprop in it, right. <laughs> which is one of the, one of the things that you got to be real nervous about in the South. It primarily occurred through a group. Uh, it, it was a, a, a school. It was called the mountain, the folk Academy Highland yeah. folk school. Okay, that's what, and if these people, like, if you go to their website, they're still around, by the way. If you go to their website, they seem pretty normal. You know, it's like, oh, okay, it's just a nonprofit or something like that. And you look at the Wikipedia page, it's like, oh, they're like, like literal communist glow ops operating, like, tra churning out communist affiliated labor activists, you know, throughout America, you know, throughout the 20th century. The thing that really, this was the thing it didn't work very well because Americans just naturally, they would, they would try to train these people into like doctrinaire ideological, like communist. And it didn't work. It would be like, right. Cause they're just like, how do you make a Scots Irish hillbilly into a communist? Like, how are you going to tell him, are you telling capitalism's bad? He didn't know what that means. Like, right, yeah. You know, what's that? Yeah, and you have to get down and you have to suddenly translate your ideology into very practical methods, and suddenly it's saying you know, yeah. things that the Cyrus Hillbilly would shoot you for. But then all the, <laughs> they said, wait, wait, no, like, on, I was like, what, you got to kill the capitalists. What do you mean by the capitalists? I mean, the people who aren't paying you, and they're like, oh, we can do that. You know, okay, so, so like, it, you know, on the, the Blair Mountain issue, this is kind of right, how so. you, 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 the, you'll see this happen. We're like, OK, one side is communist and the other side is the government. But really, this is just a, this is just a clan feud that has, right. that, that, that has like, you know, somebody came by and gave them uniforms and they were like, sure. All right. That's the uniform we wear. These people aren't communists. They were right. So. <laughs> This might be good for a different episode later with you and I in particular covering the American labor movements in particular, right. um, because originally I think it would be fair to say it doesn't necessarily start with outside influence. I don't think that the original Knights of Labor were like communists being paid by communists from like Germany or something, unless I've just missed something entirely. Uh, no, but then I don't think so. As you proceed throughout uh, throughout American labor history, suddenly you have all of these very, very well-funded, well-organized strikes across basically all sectors uh, right at the time where a major communist revolution is happening. And then later on, uh, where after the major one is done, they start trying to push into the rest of the world and, oh, wouldn't you know it, suddenly a lot of the American industry has gone on strike and their artwork looks very similar to things that you would see elsewhere in the world. Um, yeah. Just foreshadowing there uh you I did and a i bit with that i think i did a bit with that on with jack burden whenever we were talking about i think right. did i do that did i talk that i talk about the new deal art it's like this stuff's communism man <laughs> right uh yeah but i i think that would be good for you and i to do in a later show anyways um right so we have uh we have the chapel hill sociologists and I, I was very glad that you knew what i was talking about i was uh 
I was afraid that might have been too out of the blue for a no. short notice. And the other thing would be, uh, where does someone like, uh, I've only ever read his name and I've never heard anyone talk about it. Fitzhugh? Fitzhugh? George Fitzhugh. Yeah, George so, Fitzhugh. Now the, the, the new left, the new left love George Fitzhugh. Okay. So where does I, play into this whole historiography squabble. Uh, he really doesn't. That's someone our, he, that's someone he really, would know. He really doesn't, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll do a little bit of this because I think we're mostly done with the with the lost cause. I think everybody kind of knows what it is, um, and, and how it eventually trickles down to, you know, what they what they see in the. Although I didn't talk about that Atun Shea guy, uh, but yeah, I mean, really at this point, lost causeism isn't something. This is something that you'll hear people talk about who like they read history books from about 20 years ago and then make YouTube videos about them. So it's a, it's, it's kind of a little, it's kind of a subculture, but it's a highly vocal and highly publicized. Like, like, like I said, the breakdown of consensus, they're not much bigger than I think the, the dissident right is. And the dissident right is probably going to have more cultural cachet than they do in the next you know, 20 years or so, which is one of the reasons why I hang out here, despite, I don't know if you could tell, I'm not the most doctrinaire right winger. I mean, I like, I like, I like, like Woodrow Wilson and that sort of thing. One of the reasons well, why I was like, I'm like, oh, okay. That, so we're going to need to, yeah. we're going to need to rewrite history again. I'm going to go hang out with those guys, but the, um, we can, uh, we can allow people to have, uh, you know, not, not entirely pure opinions, especially if they are, uh, yeah, good on other things. Right. Uh, now, George so. Fitzhugh. George Fitzhugh is a character that was born in Virginia. He's not from a very, not from an exceptionally wealthy family. Actually, he's from a very poor family on uh, on the Northern Neck in Virginia, which is a, a portion of the country that had been very wealthy. It's very wealthy again now, but it had been wealthy before. And then for a whole set of reasons, the wealth moved on. A railroad came through. The wealth moved on. And he is, I don't want to say too many bad things about him, but George Fitzhugh is a guy that had this idea that freedom was bullshit and that what we really needed, what we really need is a dominant elite to hang out and essentially govern everything for us. And he argued in relation to socialism and this is, this is like he's incredibly controversial because these arguments are they're familiar arguments, but we often aren't familiar with them saying, well, and this is what we need to do. We need to enslave. Slavery is great. We need a lot more slaves. We need to enslave everybody. We need to enslave your dad, your mom, your brother. We need to enslave all the white people. We need to enslave all the black people. We need to enslave everybody. And, this is really what all these Europeans over, and this is really what he's the, the argument he's making is that he's just doing Marxism and German idealism, which he argues are attempts to reconstitute the medieval system of relations. And he says they can't go far enough. They don't have the ability to do it, that the only thing that can do it is full blown slavery. Okay. And that what we need to do is concentrate all wealth and all power in the hands of a very small number of, you know, technocrats or aristocrats, whatever, whatever the hell you want to call them. And this is obviously very interesting to the new left. And like, you'll find the new left were frequently a, a low key obsessed with George Fitzhugh. If you look at recent treatments of George Fitzhugh, <laughs> the guys, uh, it's Ty Nahisi Coates, the black nationalist that writes for the Atlantic. He has a whole series of articles about, about George Fitzhugh and kind of liked him. Um, Noam Chomsky has a treatment of George Fitzhugh and kind of liked him, thinks his policies are awful, but he loves George Fitzhugh's thinking from the perspective of one that is like outside of American orthodoxy. He's like a marginalized outsider who's speaking truth to power. And they, they, they kind of like that aspect of him. But, you know, he's again... It, a lot of people spend a lot of time on him. And I think one of the things that's important to remember about George Fitzhugh is that during his own time, he was not a very well-known figure in the South. And right. he was a fairly well-known figure in the North, but that he 
like the reason his writing is so entertaining to people who do a lot of shit posting is because it, his writing is it's 100 shit post like so this is what this is how he made his money was basically going to new york writing in new york papers and this sort of thing and scandalizing abolitionists now he also believed these things i should point out like he believed them for real but he wasn't he, just a uh, grifter if you will yeah he wasn't he, but he wasn't just a grifter but it, he he's kind of a pantomime figure though and that he doesn't he after doing this for long enough he makes enough money to afford a slave and it's the greatest day of his life you know he's like yeah, finally got finally i can afford a slave but he's not a member of what you would call the southern power class or anything he's not He's not a political. He's not a political somebody. He's not even a member of the planter class or the you know the aristocracy. Uh, he's 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 a guy who write. He reads a lot. He doesn't have a lot of formal education. And you can tell he if you read his if you read his books and you've read the the books he's referencing, you can tell that he doesn't have much firsthand knowledge of Marxism or of German idealism. What he does have, though, are a lot of British magazines where British writers give their opinion about things that are happening in Germany. And that's kind of what he uses to form his idea, his ideas of like European ideology at the present time and comes to this conclusion that slavery, that according to these guys, slavery is what we need to all be doing. And he packages that and he like in the most, you know, the most viral terms he possibly can and engages in debates with northerners and that's how he made his money okay so that's like one of the things you have to that's going back into like how did the civil war actually really happen now? Right. which again has not been not really been the focus here which right exactly i just figured i might bring it up in case there's a uh, someone left with a question uh where yeah. does our uh, where does the dissident rights favorite uh yeah, apologist, if you will. Yeah, okay, this is like, because somebody brought up earlier academic agents' argument that slaves had, that slaves lived better than free Irishmen. Okay, there's a couple of things about this. One, it's true, okay? And so, like, <laughs> and this is the reason why I, 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 I won't push back against it. But it, it, it does, like, that it occurs to someone to make this argument that like that's the way the new left thinks so the new left they, they tend to like george fitzhugh because first of all he was anti-capitalist he accuses you know he accuses northern industrial capitalism of being the perfect opposite uh of southern so sl southern slavery socialism okay and that's the way he framed it and that is just weird enough for these guys to like cotton on to like they they liked it because they tended to want to form like a grab bag of like oppositional perspectives to the regime and kind of weld them together under a vague you know set of principles or a vague plank or something like that, that sounds familiar <laughs> you know but, yeah. but, uh, but so, the, you know the, there's nothing wrong with that and it worked for them you know it, it, it I'm, I don't know if it'll work twice, but like, we'll, we'll, that's totally beside the point. But um, that's that. Yeah, that's how George Fitzhugh is, and that's really how the dissident right, from what I can see, treats him. Because uh, I've, uh, you know, everybody wants to read this book. So, you know, Imperium Press publishes it and everything. <clears throat> everybody wants to read this book, and it's definitely an entertaining book. Like, and it is like okay, like you can. It is like Libs owned the 1865 edition. <laughs> you know, is right. is is what it is and it's entertaining but i think one of the things that gets lost in translation is that that's exactly how it was read in 1850 as well there goes there goes crazy fitzhugh again um right. so, i don't I know I, I don't know how i like I, you know there was there's occasionally there'll be talks that he's a serious political philosopher i don't know how seriously we need to be taking a guy who's like <laughs> the most similar perspective i can think of on world politics to George Fitzhughes is like Bill Gates, right? <laughs> you know, like I'm like, <laughs> yeah, dissolving everyone's property into a class of aristocrats in order to bring about something much more uh, egalitarian. Supposedly. Right? Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's 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 Marxism, it's technocracy. But I would I would suggest that everyone I would suggest reading it because it's such an entertaining read. So uh, with that out of the way, um, there's not as much more to cover. Just one of my more personal opinions. I feel like uh, focusing on 
what the cause of the civil war is, is a lot more of the uh, orthodox academics or the uh, modern left's game is. If you want to focus on where it actually matters, it's probably reconstruction uh, that would be the main thing to focus on. If I were to give my own personal opinion, but perhaps you differ, Mr. Sandbatch. Well, no, I think those are two separate, those are two separate fronts of the same war, but there has not been... Reconstruction is the low-hanging fruit, and it, it sort of amazes me because there's not very much writing on 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 Reconstruction in the in the contemporary milieu, and that's by design. So, right. like, if you if, if you were looking to, and you know, this is a whole topic for another stream, is why does a his, narrative of history even matter? But if you were looking to reform one right now, Reconstruction has a lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of low hanging fruit in, um, in reconstruction. And then there, but the, the cause of the civil war itself too, uh, this is one of the things the civil war is, like I said, it's the most second, most written about topic in the history of the world, which is like, that's. Uh, well, I'm going to assume that that was a, uh, misclick perhaps on Mr. Sandbatch's part and we will be joined by him soon right now. Welcome back. Yeah, yeah, the, the Linux got me. The Linux monster got me. But if there is a, um, it, it, one of the things that has always amazed me is that, and it's actually very intimidating to grad students that want to go write about the Civil War, or write about the South, because one of the things you have to contend with is that there's such an incredible volume of material to go through that there's no way you could ever make a dent in it. It's just it's like trying to climb an endlessly an endlessly growing mountain of paper. But one of the things that eventually struck me about this, because I was, you know, I, I went and did it. One of the things that eventually struck me about this is that everybody's answer is wrong. That the, the reason there continues to be so much paper that gets us the, so much argumentation around the Civil War is that nobody has actually written down what the right answer is. So, I mean, I think if someone, okay, Reconstruction, I think, is an important thing. It's an easy thing to focus on, and there's a lot of ground that you can cover there. But if you want to make like the Death Star run, you know, you know, you want to you want to send your proton torpedoes into the core of the Death Star. If you can properly answer the question why this why why the Civil War happened, then you've solved the central question in American history, the most important question in American history. You know, and so the, there's a lot of power in that. <laughs> you know, but it, yeah. it's, it's a more difficult task. So uh, with that, I think that we have uh, very nicely uh, summarized a lot of the uh, historiography uh, arguments and debates that have uh, dominated American history since, uh, since the uh, so-called Civil War. Uh, we can call it uh, by any number of names if, uh, like me, the war, uh, you don't the like wall, The wall, wall of non-aggression. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I... Next week, um, if I cannot get a uh, set of pastors on to discuss a couple of things with me, uh, live on air as usual, uh, I am going to probably look to see if I can have you back on, Mr. Sandbatch, and we can talk about um, something very much related to this is what I have in mind. Uh, that being, you know, what would be a good way to view all these things? What would we see as our correct historiography? And I have a feeling that will be a much uh, longer, much more thorough episode uh, than the summary well, we've given to I think this is I think this has been pretty good. I mean, the only thing like the whenever I talk about this subject, again, because I have this question, like, you know, I haven't it doesn't occur to me that I need to stop and explain what a filibuster is or anything like that. But I also <laughs> don't really I don't really want people to get too in the weeds about it. I don't want to get too into the weeds about it on a stream because really I think we I think I think we covered the highlights. Right. Well enough, and it, and it, I right. It's, Not such, a, it's, so it's such a labyrinthine topic that right. you know, I really want to leave it open to people who can explore however they want to. Yes, um, I was going to say not everyone's going to be an American historian and is going to use what we say as the foundation of it. There's only going right. to be a few people in our audience, perhaps if there is any at all, uh, that will go on to look into this. We uh, provide them with good uh, places to look as a result. Uh, so. Uh, if we do cover, you know, what we would see to be the correct view instead of just giving an overview of what has existed already, uh, it will probably be just as summarized, maybe a little bit more granular in some places. Uh, but I, I, I feel like that would be good. It would be uh, here's our places where our guys can go look to uh, see 
uh, you know, what's going on with the Civil well, War. you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. There's a great, um, I think it's Sh Shotwell Press is the website. They have a good book written by a, a professor. He's actually the, the editor of John C. Calhoun's uh, personal papers. He's a very successful historian by the name of Clyde Wilson. And he actually has, I think it's like six bucks. And I think Shotwell is still on Amazon. So if you want to use Amazon, you can do that. I always like to, uh, I always like to plug, plug Shotwell's stuff. And uh, Dr. Wilson wrote a set of, it a set of it basically a historiography, a historiographical bibliography of like what he considers to be is like Southern history, but from the right. Um, and there's a whole, it's three volumes, it's three very slim volumes because they're paperbacks, but it like covers antebellum reconstruction in the new South. And then I think the third one is Southern literature. Um, those are, you know, I can't, I, they're so good that like me trying to write a book, this is one of the things me, because I've been trying to write a book and like, it's like you're going to, or when people ask me what to read about this sort of thing, really, he did such a good job that I have a hard time, like being like, like, dude, this is already done. You just go buy this and it'll, it'll come to you in a nice, pretty printed version and, you know, better than I could ever give you. But I can come on. I can come on podcast, and you can't get Clive Wilson to come on podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have a feeling you might be underselling yourself just a little bit. Uh, you know a lot of, uh, well, as your Substack might suggest, the esoteric part of Americana. So, um, with that being said, I am uh, trying to wrap up much sooner right. today than we usually do, and that is because my good friend Radical Liberation has uh, just started his show with his uh, wife. Uh, where they will be talking about sex and society, you know, that small issue that, uh, right. <laughs> that so uh, you guys might find that interesting. I will send the link in the chat right now, and I think that we will wrap up, and next week I will either be joined uh, by a group of pastors, if I can arrange that, that will be somewhere in the near future, if not, and uh, once again, if not, uh, Mr. Sambach and I will probably be here again, perhaps with another guest, uh, discussing our admittedly very biased view of American history. If you want to make uh, that biased. one crazy, if you want to make that one crazy, go get Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that might not be a terrible idea. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, yeah. So, and yeah, I originally was trying to have Paul Fahrenheit on today, uh, but that did not quite materialize. So, uh, do you have anything to chill, sir, before we uh, leave off? Oh, no, you don't, but I'll leave, like... Like I, I want an excuse to use Twitter, so go follow me on Twitter. I'm Christopher Sandbadge on Twitter. Right. So yeah, go follow him there. Uh, ever so often, he will uh, wake up and you will see the elusive tweet from uh, Mr. Christopher Sandbatch on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, very scathing sometimes. Uh, so by all means, go follow him there. Go read a Substack if you are interested in more of the esoteric parts of American history. Um, and before we sign off, uh, thank you to people who are monetarily supporting me. And if you like what is being done here, uh, please consider it if you also think the quality is high enough. And I believe uh, we will see you all next week, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock a.m. Thank you for watching, everyone.